Bodie, California, a ghost town in the northeast section of California. Founded in the 1860s, in this upcoming episode, we're going to learn its history. Stay tuned. Good morning. I've been camping out for the last couple of days in the eastern Sierras of uh, California. And uh, today we're going to go out and look at a ghost town called Bodie. It's a real popular place. It's a state park uh, now. And it was created in, in 1962 as far as the state park goes. But gold was originally found in the 1860s there. And it wasn't until the 1870s, late 1870s, early uh, 1880s, when it uh, became a uh, boom town. Um, there was more than seven, 8,000 people there at one time. And today we'll see there's a lot of remnants and old buildings still existing. Although they say there's only about 20% of the buildings that are existing because some fires had burned the rest of them. But it's a real popular place. Um, again, I've been out in camping, so I have not really bought my normal McDonald's coffee, but I've been disguising camp coffee in a McDonald's cup. So let's go explore today and go check out Bodie. Come along, let's go have some fun. Here we are in Bodie, California, or at least what's left of it. There were several fires here over the years that demolished a lot of the buildings. But there's still a substantial amount that stands here. Gold was discovered here in 1859 by W.S. Bodie. He was from Poughkeepsie, New York. Unfortunately, he perished in a blizzard the very next year, so he never really got to see his town for its namesake. Gold was pretty slow uh, producing here after that, and, but until 1875 when a partial collapse happened and exposed a very rich ore body. And that was the beginning of the boom years for Bodie. A lot of buildings here. Let's go take a look at them and see all the good things that we can find. By the mid to late 1850s, placer mining on the western slopes of the Sierras began to decline. That sent thousands of prospectors back over the Sierra Nevadas into the great unknown. The determined men blazed new trails east over the high mountains while panning for gold in the rushing streams. In 1857, placer gold was discovered near the small camp dubbed Dogtown. Two years later, placer excitement moved eight miles south to what would become known as Monoville. In the summer of 1859, W.S. Bodie arrived in Monoville, and he partnered up with E.S. Black Taylor. They packed their burrows with supplies and headed northeast to pan the creeks located in the hills above. They followed the creeks up above 8,300 feet in elevation. Two days from camp, they were pleased to find color in their pans. Marking the area with stacks of rocks, they selected samples and returned to Monoville for assay. The results were staggering and word spread quickly. W.S. Bodie died in the winter of 1859 during a blizzard while he was traveling from Monoville getting supplies back to his claim. Two years later, his partner, Black Taylor, was attacked and killed by Native Americans near Benton, California. Neither of the men ever knew that they had discovered one of the largest gold and silver deposits in California, in 1861, the Bunker Hill Mine was established as well as a mill, though the camp was called home to only about 20 miners. Bodie grew slowly and remained an insignificant mining camp for 17 years. The Bunker Hill Mine and Milling Company on the west slope of the Bodie Bluff changed hands several times during the years before being sold to four partners in 1877. The name was changed to Standard Mining Company, and within a few months, the partners discovered a significant vein of rich gold ore. The profits rose dramatically, and by the end of 1878, Bodie's population had soared to some 5,000 people. The Standard Mine would yield nearly $15 million in gold over the next 25 years. The year 1877 marks the beginning of the boom years for Bodie. Communications with the outside world were established with a post office, telegraph office, and a newspaper, the Bodie Standard. Bodie sits at an elevation of 8,375 feet above sea level. 
The sage-covered hills surrounding the town is completely denuded of any timber. It sits in a bowl and is completely unprotected from the fierce winds. The high altitude and extreme weather prevents residences from gardening and raising livestock. As soon as the town was established, ranchers and farmers from Bridgeport, Antelope, Smith Valley, Mason, and Owens Valley supplied meat, milk, and vegetables. Four toll roads linked Bodie to the region. The original route was from the town site of Aurora, which connected to Virginia City and Hawthorne areas. The Lundy Bodie Road connected Mono Basin and Owens Valley. The Big Meadows Road connected to the Sonora Pass, which reached over into California. The Geiger Grade led to Bridgeport and was later used during the Masonic gold mining boom. These roads were heavily used by stagecoaches and freight teams bringing in supplies and equipment. Another fascinating part of the history of Bodie is the electrification of Bodie. Bodie not only had electricity, it was the first place in the whole world to use power brought in over long distance lines. Bodie had a monumental need for wood, not only to build and heat houses, but just as important to produce steam that powered the monstrous milling machinery. The standard mill alone used over 45 cords of wood a day at a cost of over $1,500 per month. That equates to about $50,000 a month today. Total wood consumption in Bodie was close to 5 million board feet of lumber each year. Because the surrounding treeless hills provided nothing but sagebrush, hauling wood from distant Jeffrey Pines and Pinion Pine forests contributed substantially to the staggering cost of wood. Woodcutting and hauling made many men wealthier than the stockholders of the mines and eventually led to building of a railroad with the sole purpose of shipping wood to Bodie. James Stuart Kane was a visionary. He possessed the qualities of a successful man. He arrived in Bodie in 1879 at the age of 25. He was also a major stockholder of the Standard Mine at that time. He was innovative and persuasive never afraid to gamble against all odds. With his mines declining in production and the population of Bodie doing the likewise, going from a rise in one year from 3,500 to about 8,000 in 1880 and then dropping to less than 1,500 in 1887, Bodie needed a revival. The electrification of Bodie postponed its demise for several years. The superintendent of the Standard Consolidated Mining Company, Thomas Leggett, was quite certain that power could be transmitted over wires and used many miles from its source. Reluctant stockholders had to be convinced that this was possible. Doubters dubbed the experiment as Leggett's and Kane's folly, since long-distance transmission of power had never been tried before. Up to this time, hydroelectric power was used only at its source. So little was known about transporting electricity that the engineers were instructed not to have any curves in the lines. Construction began in the spring of 1892 at Green Creek, eight miles south of Bridgeport and 13 miles from Bodie. After many delays caused by accidents and slow delivery of machinery, in October of 1893, the switches were thrown and slowly the lights came on. The wheels of the small motors began to turn. Then the larger ones hummed a steady tune. Power had arrived to Bodie. The Green Creek development produced only enough power for the mill and a few select businesses in the town. Power for homes was still a few years out. In 1910, a second plant was built at Jordan to serve residences and commercial buildings at the foot of Copper Mountain using water from Mill Creek and Lundy Canyon. Sadly, that power did not stay on long as a massive snow avalanche thundered down Copper Mountain in March of 1911, wiping out the Jordan plant, killing seven persons and knocking out power to Bodie. The power plant was reconstructed in a safer location. 
and power was restored to Bodie sometime in December of 1911. The power plant is still generating electricity today. This is the rough alignment for the power that goes to Bodie residences in 1910 from the Jordan power plant. This building is known as the Hydroelectric Building. It was a substation for the distribution of the town's electricity in 1910. I didn't find a whole lot of information on Bodie's water sources. However, I did read that there was plenty of springs nearby and there were some creek beds also that provided water periodically, apparently enough to satisfy the needs of the mining operations and the domestic and fire protection within the town of Bodie. There was a mapping company that was real popular back in the uh, 1890s and early 1900s. It was called Sanborn Paris Map Company. They typically gave an assessment of the fire protection system within a town at that time. The notes on that map say that Bodie has a gravity water system, a 100,000 gallon reservoir, a quarter mile southeast of the post office, at an elevation 200 feet above Main Street, and water being supplied by a pump in Standard Mine. 50 barrel hydrants with good pressure. The original Methodist church built in 1896, the only church that's still existing today in Bodie. There was a Catholic church that was also built in 1882. It burned down in 1928. E.J. Clinton, head of a mining company in Bodie in the late 20s, restored this Methodist church with his own hands and often preached sermons. The house shown in the foreground is known as the Miller House. Tom Miller was born in Canada, worked as a teamster for the Bodie Railway and Lumber Company at Mono Mills near Mono Lake. It's one of the few houses in the entire park that they allow you to walk through. Some period furniture, fireplace, wallpaper. This is the house that was owned by James Stewart Kane. He arrived in Bodie at the age of 25 in 1879. Kane entered into the lumber business and put barges and steamboats on Mono Lake to transport wood in 1888. He became a banker and kept the Bodie Bank open until 1932. In 1915, he acquired the Standard Company mining properties through court action and soon became the principal property owner in town. He always believed in Bodie's mines and would prosper again. This is a photo of the Boone Store and Warehouse. It was built in 1879 was one of the several general stores in town. It was owned by Harvey Boone, a distant cousin of Daniel Boone, and a partner with James W. Wright. Boone was active in the community, serving as a county supervisor, a school trustee, and the Bodie Water Company president. The brick building on the left is known as the Duchambo Hotel. The post office moved here in 1879. The upstairs served as Grandma Johnson's rooming house. 
Later, the building became the De Chambeau Hotel. In Bodhi's final years as a town, it was a bar and cafe. When looking through the windows, you can see the mail slots over there on the right when this used to be the post office. And then you can also see the bar stools or the cafe stools along the bar over there on the left when this was a cafe. The wooden structure there on the right is the Independent Order of Odd Fellows Lodge number 279, and it was one of Bodie's many fraternal societies. The lodge used the upper floor. The first floor was used by Henry Ward, who built the building in 1880 to house his undertaking and furniture business. It was later occupied by Bodie Athletic Club. Here's what it looks like inside. As you can see, it looks like it was a gymnasium. Here's a couple photos of the exterior that are dated back in the 1920s. The building on the far right is the Miners Union Hall, built in 1876. It was central to Bodie's social life. Besides serving as a meeting place for union members, it hosted religious services, Independence Day, grand balls, elegant masquerade parties, school recitals, and Christmas parties for young and old. The union was organized on December 22, 1877, and joined with the Western Federation of Miners as Local 61 in 1903. The building now serves as a museum and small bookstore. George Wheaton and Nicholas Lures built this store here in the early 1880s. James S. Kane, who was one of the largest property owners in Bodie, bought this store in 1898. According to his daughter-in-law, Ella Kane, the building had been a U.S. land office from 1885 to 1886. In 1910, it became the offices of the hydroelectric company that transmitted electricity to the town. And then in the 1920s, the building became a hotel and boarding house. This is a look at the Bodie Firehouse and the interior. You can see what's uh, in there, along with a typical fire hydrant spread throughout the city. This is what's left of the Bodie Bank today. The bank had gone untouched by the 1892 fire, but wasn't as lucky in the 1932 fire. James S. Kane bought the Bodie Bank in 1890 from E.L. Benedict after making a large fortune from a block of ground in the Standard Mine. From then on, Kane would be investing and building in the town quite a bit. This is a photo of the bank interior in 1913. Stuart Kane, the son of James King, is on the left, and Ed Stinson is on the right. And in between the two, you can see the bank vault that exists today. During the fire, Kane was optimistic that the building would again escape destruction, but unfortunately he was wrong. At one point, as the fire spread to the roof of the bank, a few of the men rushed into the burning building and tried to remove the beautiful walnut counter. They apparently got it to the door, but ended up getting it jammed in place so as to block the exit completely, stopping the removal of the counter and any other items that could have been saved. The schoolhouse is one of the better looking buildings in town. It was originally the Bon Ton Lodging House in 1879, but was later converted to the schoolhouse after the first one was burned down. The Standard Mill deserves an entire section to itself. The mine was originally named the Bunker Hill Mine when it was registered in 1861. Most of the inner workings are still intact. In its heyday, the mill processed more than $14 million worth of gold and silver well, over 25 years. On October 6, 1898, the original mill burned down as it was built mostly of wood. In the dead of winter at nearly 9,000 feet elevation and likely with 20 foot of snow, they immediately began rebuilding the mill. On February 1 of 1899, just a few months later, the standard mill had reopened. The new mill was also wood frame, but mostly covered with sheets of corrugated steel. 
the standard mill was always on the leading edge of technology. It was one of the reasons why it was one of the few mills that made money in the area. There were nine mills total. Most all of them were not profitable. Just to name a few innovations that allowed this mill to be technologically advanced was the outstanding and ingenious pulley system, cable system, and gondola system that ran ore directly from the mine down to the mill and the electrification of the mill, and then perfecting the cyanide process to extract gold from the ore. The cyanide process revitalized Bodie for another 10 years and is still an important part of gold mining. I've been coming up here a number of times to Bodie and I never took a tour of the mill. That mill behind me is known as the Standard Mill. Built in the late 1800s, burned down one time and rebuilt. But I'm getting ready to take a tour guided with the uh, National Park Service folks. So I got some video coming on that. Should be fun. This is one of the first structures I noticed when I got on the property of the mill. This was the home of Theodore Mildred Hoover. Theodore was the manager of the Standard Mill and lived in this house for about three years. Theodore was the brother of would-be President Herbert Hoover, who occasionally visited Bodie. But that was long before he was president. All right, Matt, tell us what's going on here. All right, so the mill workers here made $4 a day. And it might not seem like a lot today, but that was actually a lot of money back then. Um, in fact, the dock workers in San Francisco made $2 a day. An impressive drill press shown in the fabrication shop of the mill. This is the main electrical room where they first initiated power to the standard mill. Here we are standing at the base of the amalgamation tables. You can see there are four tables and at the top of those tables are five stamps each. This must have been an outrageously noisy location. A slurry produced by the stamp flows over an amalgamation table, surfaced with copper plates and smeared with mercury to catch the gold and silver. This is known as an amalgam and it is scraped off the table and carried to an amalgamation pan for further processing. Slurry that flows off the table is collected by troughs and delivered to a vayner or concentrating table. This is a cross-sectional diagram of the whole mining and milling process. It was created by the historic American engineering record. This is a photo of the chute that comes down from the amalgamation table to the shaker room. This is one of the final processes for the gold and silver. There's a mold for a gold and silver bar poured out of this vessel. As I had mentioned earlier, been through the Bodie area a number of times and had never taken the tour of the mill. It's really well worth it, very educational. As I'm walking along this beautiful place, I can't get over how many buildings are still left considering that they said there's only about 20% of the buildings that used to be here. Fortunately, I came out during the middle of the week after the uh, big weekend, 
the big Memorial or Labor Day weekend and there's not a whole lot of people here so I'm pretty happy about that as I'm walking through here which was once a very lively place full of activity with so much violence reported in Bodie this was one of the all-important buildings this is the morgue building with many places for gambling and vice the town soon became a hot spot for underhand happenings Residents turned to alcohol and gambling to entertain themselves, and not before long, things began to spiral out of control. Crime was rampant in Bodie during this time. Stagecoach robberies, saloon riots, shootouts, and other incidences of violence were almost daily occurrences in Bodie. It made the news more often than the news of gold coming out of the mines. Yet people kept coming, even bringing with their families. A popular story from the town's violent past involves a three-year-old girl from San Jose who, upon learning her family was moving to Bodie, prayed, Goodbye, God, we're going to Bodie. She believed Bodie to be so dangerous even God did not want to be there. There were even some newspapers that reported townspeople would ask in the mornings, Have we a man for breakfast? It didn't take long for the demise of Bodie. A mere couple of years after the crazy growth of the town, the decline began to set in. The expensive machinery used in the multiple mines and mills needed more expensive upkeep and supplies. Hardly any gold was being found anymore. Residents weren't able to work in a mining town that wasn't much mining of anything. A few mines that seemed so hopeful just a year or two prior were completely abandoned even before the new year of 1881, people began leaving Bodie trying to find the next profitable town. The boomtown's population dwindled and dwindled and dwindled until it reached a tiny 800 people. For those 800 people, Bodie had just enough left in it to support them for three more decades. While some companies were still able to continue digging their mines, when they would find gold, it was hardly enough for the company, let alone the workers. The already low profit coming into Bodie continued to fluctuate, but ultimately it plummeted. Companies tried to cut down on expenses any way they could, but more residents left. The very first company to form from Bodie's prime era, the Standard Company, gave up in 1913. The Standard was the town's most wealthy mine and company. The remaining handful of companies still open continued the struggle to stay afloat. The years following Standard's closing, some hopeful prospectors tried to revive Bodie's hills and mines, but to no avail. Bodie had at least two devastating fires during its life. There was a large fire in 1892 that wiped out a significant portion of the town. And in 1932, another devastating fire left Bodie pretty much as you see it today. By the time World War II and its hardships hit, Baron Bodie was abandoned once again. Not long after, Bodie's population dropped to zero. Thanks so much for watching my video about Bodie. As with all my videos, I thoroughly enjoy the experience. I love being in the outdoors, walking where many, many people used to be. And listen to the silence that there is now. Modi was a wonderful and beautiful place, but only for a short period of time. Its harsh winters gave people no reason to stay there once gold ran out. But I thoroughly enjoy the experience, and I'm glad you guys got to come along with me. Thanks again for watching my video.